Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Kevin Cosby here at St. Stephen Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, with another powerful point to ponder as we spend meaningful moments with the Master. Thank you for joining me uh, as we conclude this exciting study of Acts chapter 16. We've entitled uh, The Bee That Stings is the same bee that produces honey. And sometimes the circumstances of life that stings us are the same circumstances of life that produces something sweet if we'll just wait on God. And yesterday we looked at how Paul was beaten, him and Silas, and thrown in jail in solitary confinement. Their backs are beaten. But at midnight, Paul and Silas starts praying to God, and we're told that the prisoners heard them. Well, something else happened. Look, if you will, with me at verse 25 of Acts chapter 16. What an exciting chapter it is. Verse 25 says again, but at midnight, what a wonderful conjunction. Beat up, but not defeated. Beat down, but not beat back. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Please note, they were not singing to the prisoners. They were singing to God but they were influencing the prisoners unconsciously. Most of our influence is unconscious influence. In other words, we're influencing people and we don't know that we're influencing them. Either good or bad, we are influencing people. We're just not conscious of it. And Paul was influencing the prisoners who were there in jail and they didn't know it. These prisoners were getting saved. And not only did they imprison, they influence, excuse me, the prisoners around them but they also impacted heaven, which was above them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Now, where did this earthquake come from? I believe what happened was that as Paul and Silas were singing, I can see the angels lifting up the windows of heaven and the sounds, the melodious voices of some midnight singers singing in Sing Sing Jail with bloody backs in stocks, in solitary confinement, the angels say, God, you got to hear this. And they opened the windows of heaven and sweet, melodious sounds of Paul and Silas ascended into heaven. And it was so sweet that God started patting his feet. And, you know, the Bible teaches that heaven is God's throne and earth is God's footstool. So if God starts patting his feet because Paul and Silas were singing, the earth rocked. It shook. It was an earthquake. God sent an earthquake. Now, Paul could have interpreted the earthquake negatively. Like all of us, we anything that happens, we interpret it negatively. We see the stinger and we could have said, my God, I've been beat up. I've been beat down. I got a bloody back. I've been put in jail. I've been arrested. I am in the inner part of the prison. And now I got an earthquake. But guess what? That earthquake was Paul's friend. It reminds me of the book of Exodus. You remember when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, Pharaoh's behind them, mountains on both sides, Red Sea in front of them. And then all of a sudden it's the wind starts blowing. And somebody started complaining and said, oh, look, the wind starts blowing. And somebody said, yeah, the wind is blowing, but look at the Red Sea. It's parting because an east wind blew it. And how many east winds that we thought were against us was really opening away for us? And how many earthquakes that we may think, oh, this is bad is really good for us because guess what happened as a result of the earthquake? As a result of the earthquake, the chains that Paul was in flew open and the doors to the dungeon cells came off their hinges and they were no longer confined, neither Paul and the prisoners. Remember he was beat? Well, the guard who beat Paul also felt the tremor of the earthquake. He felt the tremor of the earthquake and he he asked for a light when he went down to the jail to see what was going on and all he saw was the doors wide open to the prison. And he just assumed that now that the doors are open that the prisoners had escaped. And uh, verse 27 says, and the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep, that earthquake awakened him and seeing the prison's doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Now, why was he going to kill himself? Because the penalty for allowing a prison to escape under your watch meant death. So he was about to kill himself. 
verse 28 says, but Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Who's all here? Paul's there, Silas is there, and the prisoners are all there also. They did not escape. That's a miracle, but they're saved now. They did not escape, and so he doesn't kill himself. Now, what would you say to the prisoner who's going to kill himself and he had just had beat you? You would have said, well, served you right. But Paul did not get on the level of the prisoner. Paul extended to him grace, and Paul extended to him grace because Paul had received grace from God. And you extend people grace because God has extended grace with you. He said, do yourself no harm. And I'm so glad he said that. And then after he says, but Paul called a loud voice, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Verse 29, verse 29 says, then he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Guess who gets saved? The prison guard man gets saved. The man who beat Paul gets saved. And that's the reason God allowed Paul to go to jail in the first place. So that the brothers in jail and the guards in jail you know, who didn't understand that black lives matters, that they get saved also. And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. He says, believe. Now, there are five quick things I want you to notice about this, about salvation. And you kind of write these down. It's very important. Point one, here are some implied things in the question he asked. He says, uh, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Here are five implied uh, truths behind the question, what must I do to be saved? Truth number one, there are two kinds of people, the saved and the unsaved. You're either saved or you're not saved. That's the first point implied in the question, what must I do to be saved? Uh, because everyone's not saved. Point number two, assumption. To be saved means that you have to be conscious of the fact that you're lost. The reason he asked the question was because he knew he was not saved. So implied in the question is a recognition that he's got some issues, he's not saved. Point number three, first point is there's two people, that, kinds of people, those who are saved and not saved. Point number three is he's conscious of the fact that you have, that he's not saved and you have to be conscious of the fact that you're not saved to be saved. Point number three, and that is the question implies that you can be saved. And we already know people can be saved in this chapter because there was a woman who had a tender heart named Lydia and she, God opened her heart to the truth of the gospel and she opened her home to Paul. And then there was also a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and she got saved. So you can be saved, implied in the question number four, and that is that salvation is a personal thing. He said, what must I do to be saved? It's personal. It begins with you, it doesn't end with you. God is saving you for a purpose, for good works. And then there, the fifth question, he said, what must I do of the fifth implication? What must I do to be saved? Which means number five, I must do something. To be a Christian, you have to do something. And verse 31 tells us what you have to do. Look at verse 31. So they said, let me read it, behave. No, it doesn't say that. We're not saved by behaving. It says, believe. We are saved by believing. We believe in Jesus Christ and we put our total trust in Jesus. And then notice, give me some B words. Let me give you some B words. First B word is belief. You have to believe. And then after you believe, one of the signs that you're saved is you be bear witness to other people. It says in verse 31, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your household. So he began to bear witness and tell his testimony to his 
to his, his family. You bear witness. You believe. You bear witness. You tell other people what God has done for you, how you are about to commit suicide. Some of us are, are committing suicide. The things we're doing is suicidal. But God has had mercy upon us. And God is saying, quit doing yourself harm. Do yourself no harm. So many times we think other people are harming us, but nobody has hurt Kevin Cosby like Kevin Cosby has hurt Kevin Cosby. And God says, do yourself no harm. Believe, bear witness. And then notice that he is baptized. It says, verse 32, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and his family were baptized. So that's the third B word. First B word is believe. Second, bear witness to your family. Then once you and your family are saved, get baptized. Get baptized. And if you're part of the digital church, we are going to baptize you. We will find a church for you and we'll do it online to baptize you. You need to be baptized. Not that baptism saves you. But it's a sign that a transformation, a change is taking in place in your life. And then finally, brotherhood. Brotherhood. And verse 33 says that he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. He inflicted the stripes. So he's repairing them. That's a sign that you've been saved. If you, if you caused the wound, you should be fixing the wound. That's the problem with the United States of America today when it comes to racial justice. They've created the wounds for black people, but they won't repair the wounds. You need to repair the wounds. That's called justice. And not only does he repair the wounds, but he helps stress the importance of Paul as a citizen. He's being treated like this. Silas is being treated like that because he's a citizen. But they're not respecting his citizen rights. See, remember, he's a Jew, but Paul is also a Roman citizen. Jesus was not a Roman citizen. Jesus was excluded. That's why he was crucified. Roman citizens could not be beaten like this. Roman citizens could not be crucified. Only those who were excluded. The reason why black people can deal with Jesus is because Jesus was excluded and we know what it means to be excluded. But look at again at verse 34. Look at verse 34. And verse 34 reads, and when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. He rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. And, and when it was day, the magistrates sent uh, officers saying, let these men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have said, let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans. They didn't know Paul was a Roman citizen and have thrown us into to prison. And now... Do they put us out secretly? In other words, they wanted to cover this up. No, indeed, let them come themselves and get us out. In other words, Paul stressing his citizenship rights, his right as a citizen, and so should black Americans. See, this is, this is so relevant to us. Those who say that the Bible is a white man's book, that's because they haven't really read the Bible. Or they, haven't, they read it, but they didn't understand what they were looking at. Because this is what's happening to black people in America. We get beat up in police custody. We're in jail. Then they want to cover it up. And the officials told, verse 38, and the officials told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they, that they were Romans. They didn't know that they were Roman citizens. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. Paul should have said, only after you write me a check. Paul gets justice or semi-justice. And then verse 40 says, so they went out of prison and entered the house of Lydia where it all started. Remember Lydia, they go open her home to there. They go back to Lydia. And this is probably Paul at his best. Verse 40 is Paul at his best. And if you can get to verse 40, you will be at your best. It says, so they went out of prison, just got out of prison, entered the house of Lydia, just got out of prison, go back to Lydia's house. And when they had seen the brethren, that's the Christians, they encouraged them and departed. Now, why is that Paul is best? Now, let me get, get it straight. Paul has just been beat. So verse 40 is really Paul at his, at his best. It says, so they went out of prison, into the house of Lydia, that's where it all started, Lydia's house. She, God opened her heart to Paul because Paul was kind to her. And she opened up her, her home and her resources because she was the richest person there. 
in Philippi. And when they had seen the brethren, when she goes back to Lydia's house, it says they, Paul and Silas, encouraged them and departed. Now that's that's something. Here's the man that's just been in jail. Here's the man that's been in solitary confinement. Here's the man that endured an earthquake. Here's a man who has a bloody back. And you think he would go to Lydia's house and say, woe is me. Look at what has happened to me. Oh, this is bad. But Paul doesn't speak the woe is me language. Instead, in his pain, he encouraged others. No wonder Paul was such an exceptional man, not perfect, not flawless, but an exceptional man that we learn a whole lot from. And this is what we learn. And that the, is that the same bee, that same bee that produces the sting is the same bee that produces honey. And right now you're feeling the effects of the sting, but wait on the Lord, because that honey, that honey, that bee produces the honey and something sweet can come from some of the most painful experiences in life. My God, God is in control. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and bless your people, we pray. Never let us forget that the bee, the, the situation, the circumstances that produces the sting to hurt us, it's also the bee that produces the honey. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being with me for another powerful point to ponder. Look, everybody needs a church home. And look, if you don't have a church home, we'd love to invite you to become a part of St. Stephen Church. Be a virtual member, a digital disciple. Contact us, email us, newstart at ssclive.org. We will get back with you. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful service. Uh, uh, Brother Jason Claiborne is going to do music from his new CD. And uh, it, it, we're going to have a time tomorrow. So you come and join us. The pre-worship experience begins uh, at nine o'clock with Miss Crystal, and then we'll come together and, and worship God together and be blessed by the word of God. So join us and don't forget, remember the Philippian jailer, remember he had a belief, but he, but he, but he also bear witness, he told his family. So you tell people in your circle to tune in to SSC Live and I promise you they will thank you and they'll be blessed as a result of it. So God bless you, see you tomorrow in worship, but until then you enjoy this day and don't forget during COVID-19, don't forget to stay safe, stay sane, and never forget that God is still in control. Don't forget that. Love you. Take care. See you in worship tomorrow.